Let me find. Everyone is coming in. So it looks like we have everybody in here. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Karen Goodfellow, um, and I'd like to welcome you all to the August 10th meeting of the Boston Art Commission. Um, I'm the Director of Public Art in the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, and in that capacity, I'm also the Director of the Boston Art Commission. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually. To ensure public access to the deliberations of the Boston Art Commission, the public can join this meeting through telephone and video conferencing. For those of you with us today, this meeting is being recorded and closed captioning is available. You can access it at the bottom of the screen. And if you have trouble looking that button, please chat us for assistance. And I also ask that everybody um, update your name and pronouns in your Zoom um, profile and to please keep yourself muted. Um, I, we need a moment to get our presentation going, uh, but as we're doing that, I will um, keep, keep with the introduction. Looks like it's starting up. Um, artworks proposed for City of Boston property are reviewed at these public meetings of the Boston Art Commission. The BAC is a commissioning body for the city of Boston. Working together with the public art team and the mayor's office of arts and culture, the Boston Art Commission is an independent board composed of two ex officio and seven appointed volunteer art and design professionals that holds public meetings to review, discuss and vote on matters concerning the city's art collection. The BAC has exclusive authority to approve and commission artworks intended to be added to the city's collection or be placed on city property. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture and the Boston Art Commission believe that public art is any artwork installed in publicly accessible spaces where they can be experienced by everyone. We engage in discussion about public art in Boston in order to foster the creation and collection of artworks that reflect the people, ideas, histories, and futures of Boston, which is on the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the continuing presence of the Massachusetts as well as the Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples. We also recognize the indigenous peoples represented in the city's residents in addition to those in the diaspora. Our meetings are generally held the second Tuesday of each month to review current public art projects cited on or proposed for City of Boston properties. And we hope you'll continue to join us. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture has a dedicated public art team that manages all daily operations and duties related to public art projects cited on or proposed for City of Boston property. This team facilitates the Boston Art Commission's monthly public meetings like today, and manages all phases of Boston's public art projects in collaboration with the Boston Art Commission, community members and colleagues at the city of Boston. I'm joined by the public art team, Jessica Kami, data coordinator, Sarah Rodrigo, public art project manager, and Trisha Gorain, collections manager, who will be helping to facilitate this meeting. Trisha will add our contact information to the chat. And I'll now hand it over to Chair Mark Pasnick and Vice Chair Equa Holmes, who will call the meeting to order and go over some further instruction. Thanks very much, Karen. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm calling this public hearing to order at 4.06 p.m. Today, the Boston Art Commission will be holding its monthly public meeting. I'll begin now with a roll call of commissioners to confirm a quorum. After I state your name, commissioners, please say here. Camilo Alvarez. Here. John Andres. Here. Michael Canizzo. Here. Kara Elliott Ortega. Here. Uh, Brian Hone. Here. Uh, and Kimberly Pinder. I believe she's here, but on a line, correct? Can you unmute yourself, Kimberly? Perhaps she's not able to speak. Well, nonetheless, we do have a quorum. I'm here too. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm here. I'm also here. Kim's Great. here. So that was Aqua and Kim. Thank you both. Yeah. Sorry about that, Aqua. No worries. <laughs> you're, you're next to me on the photo list, so I didn't see you. 
Uh, so we do have a quorum. Uh, now we have an even bigger quorum. Um, we will, in the next slide, uh, we will review meeting minutes from the previous July 13th meeting of the Boston Art Commission. Are there any comments or modifications any commissioner would like to make? I, I do want to note that I sent in a, a typo correction to them uh, on the spelling of one word, but besides that, it looked good to me. Any other comments on the minutes from last time? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move to approve the minutes. Okay, and that was John? Yes. Okay, great. I second that. Okay, Camilo. And uh, let's take a vote then. So uh, all those in favor of the motion, um, Aqua. Uh, you're muted. I'm abstaining because I wasn't there. Okay. Uh, Camilo? Yes. John? Yes. Michael? Yes. Cara? Yes. Brian? Yes. Kim? I'm not sure if she's... Um, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, and yes. then I'm a yes as well, so the motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's see, next up on this slide, on this next slide, you will see uh, the agenda we will be following today. The agendas for these meetings are always posted publicly on boston.gov. We'll begin with the director's report and then move into presentations for review. At the time of presentations, we will provide you with information about how you as members of the public can participate. Please note, we will be tabling the discussion regarding the City of Boston public art collection policies and processes and the vice chair chair rotation discussion. We'll now have Karen Goodfellow give her director's report. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we have a few presentations for review today. Um, including the Transformative Public Art Program for 2021, uh, the Wolf Square Street Mural, and the Within Web Final Acceptance. I have a few updates on community-initiated commissioning projects. Uh, firstly, our um, Assistant Corporation Counsel, Nyla Freeman, reached out to the lawyer for the Boston Foundation as well as the King Boston team on July 13th to make sure everyone is comfortable with the final draft of the Embrace MOU. And I don't believe we've heard back from them yet, but it's our understanding that they are still working on an artist agreement and we hope to hear from them soon. And updates will follow at our next meeting as soon as we know that's finalized. In July of this year, the Douglas Plaza project was approved for $400,000 in uh, Community Preservation Act funds, CPA funds, as well as $300,000 in Capital City funds. And a special thanks to Sarah, uh, who worked with our um, Director of Administration Finance, Nida Faria, Aideen Brown from the CPA, and our former budget analyst, Gabby Germanos, for, for those funds. Uh, the Douglas Plaza will be a new community space in Roxbury and the home of the legacy of Frederick Douglas by Maru Chiodo after drawing by Paul Goodnight. Images of the maquette and Goodnight Strongs can be seen on the right. We're working with the Frederick Douglass Sculpture Committee who's been leading this project for many years, very tirelessly, and Sasaki Associates and the Department of Public Works who owns the site to move the plaza forward and bring the long awaited sculpture to Boston. So we've been quite busy on this project for some time and we're really excited to take this to the next step. And we'll be hearing from Gina Ha from the Asian Community Development Corporation about the short-term installation residence lab 2021 next. Um, Gina, please feel free to unmute and share your project. Hi everyone, so nice to be here. I'm here with um, our co-facilitator for the program, Leslie um, from the Pop Art Center as well, if you wanna wave, Leslie. Um, okay, so just real quick, Residence Lab is a collaboration between the Asian Community Development Corporation, as well as Pow Art Center and creatives and local residents in Chinatown. The goal is really to use arts and culture to shape land use decisions in the neighborhood. And this is amidst rapid gentrification and displacement that we're seeing. Um, so we team up civic artists um, civic practice artists with residents from the, from the local neighborhood to co-design an installation um, that would be exhibiting for one month in a private or in a public space. Next slide, please. 
Great. So as we all know, the pandemic has hit Chinatown residents and businesses um, really hard. And this year, uh, we've really thought a lot about collective care and what that looks like in our neighborhood. Um, and so that's the theme for this 2021 year that our three artists and residence teams are going to be responding to. Um, answering the question, what would it look like if gathering spaces um, looked and felt like we cared for them and if it was a conduit for how we show care for each other. So we chose a site that could all use a little bit of tender love and care, the Mary Suhu Park on the Greenway. Um, it is right now a drab gray concrete place, um, but we, we worked with um, our friends um, at the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy in close partnership to design a one month installation that will be um, going in at the end of August. Next slide, please. Um, so these are renderings of what the three artist resident teams are proposing. Um, on the left side, you'll see planters and a miniature rendering of where they'll be placed. Um, so different residents, um, we've been fighting for a community garden in, in the neighborhood for a really long time and, and green space. And so um, artists and residents are proposing to show a collective garden that folks will take care of and uh, people will be invited to put their hopes and dreams um, in the form of butterflies on them. The second installation I'll be going in is a tiered picnic table that would encourage folks to gather and um, yeah, and share experiences. Um, and the third are uh, footprints, different kinds of footprints that we see um, that will have different points of junction and um, it's called Pathways to Unity. And that'll encourage folks to really activate the space more and explore the space. Right now, only um, one side of the park is really being used and the other um, is really underutilized or misused. Um, and so we're hoping that the footprints will help um, guide folks through the space. Um, so yeah, in overall, um, these installations really focus on joy, play and mutual aid, um, things that we've seen um, witnessed throughout Chinatown's history, but especially this past year. And the exhibit runs Friday, August 27th through Saturday, September 25th. Um, and we'll have the kickoff event on that Friday. So you all are invited to come into Chinatown. Um, that's it. I can open it up for questions. And I'm throwing in the, the link to you. Thank you. And Leslie, if there's anything that I missed that you want to chime in on, feel free. No, that was great, Gina. I think the only thing I would add is that um, it is a very unique residency program in that it really partners artists with local Chinatown residents, um, which is, I, I think, a very unique uh, program within the Boston area. Okay. If there are no questions, then we can... Thank, thank you very much for sharing with us. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we'll review long-term city initiated public art projects uh, within Web at the Jamaica Plain branch of the Boston Public Library and Curtis Hall BCYF has been installed and we'll review it later in this meeting. Uh, three commissions are in fabrication, Joe Wardwell and Nakia Hill's artwork for the Roxbury branch of the BPL and Unis Mundus by Monica Bravo will both be installed this fall and memory, memory diffusion by Masari Studios will be installed in spring of 2022. Four projects are currently in final design phase. The play team, Marlon Forrester and Studio Luz are now working on their final design after you approved their preliminary design last month's meeting. The artists for Hyde Square are revisiting their design based on your, the feedback they received from you at their advisory review in June. And the final design for the other artwork uh, for the Boston Arts Academy by Simon Donovan and Ben Olmstead will be presented this fall after they receive the necessary site approval from the Public Improvement Commission. Five projects are in preliminary design. design. Uh, both artworks for Vine Street and the entryway artwork for the Roxbury branch of the BPL by Jeremy Sobek Harrison. Two contracts have been executed since our last meeting. Jenny Sabin, the artist for the Ruggles Corridor, and Ricardo Dean Five Gomez, the artist for the Roxbury Branch Exterior Site, are both beginning work on their designs and planning their community engagement. 
The artists for the Engine 42 Fire Station project are negotiating an agreement, and we look forward to sharing uh, more about that project with you soon. And the artists you approved last month for the Adams branch of the Boston Public Library, Priscilla de Carvalho, is reviewing the contract documents. And we have one project, the Transformative Public, public Art, uh, for artist selection tonight, but there are a number of artists and sites for review. At the moment, we have no open calls to artists to share with you, but anticipate several will be released later this year. And collections manager Trisha Gilrain has been researching and developing materials for a report regarding the relationship between mural and brick facades based on conversations we had when we were reviewing uh, murals in East Boston um, last month. Um, and we'll share it with the commission when it's finalized so that we can be sure we are following best practices with all our murals. And next we'll go on to collections projects. After the Boston Art Commission voted unanimously to remove the bronze figurative elements of the Emancipation Group located in Park Plaza, we determined that the sculpture would remain in storage, secure storage, while we further document the artwork and identify a museum, library, or another appropriate site for recontextualization. The public art team and working group um, spoke and we also did extensive research to local museums and libraries and asked for suggestions via an online form, but we'd not been able to find an appropriate alternative site, although we are still um, taking suggestions. In January, we'd been contacted by Scott Lewis representing the Cottleville Historical Commission uh, in Cottleville, Missouri. Has a, they have a connection to Archer Alexander, the man on which Thomas Ball based um, the kneeling figure. Lewis proposed a long-term loan of the Emancipation Group to complement a new public art commissioning project uh, in which they would show Archer Alexander in a standing position. We've discussed the possibility of this loan with him, the town of Cottleville, and we, uh, they at this time don't have funding and so they'll be looking at grants and we've discussed, we've suggested that they apply for planning grants to really think it through so that we could all think, um, think about this possibility. Um, and we've offered him some background and administrative support during that process. And obviously before any decision is made, this would come before the Boston Art Commission uh, at a public meeting, uh, but we wanted to make sure to keep you informed of the conversation that we've been having. Sudden Presence, the sculpture by Beverly Pepper, currently located in the West End neighborhood, will be moved in August. Um, and I, we might have the final date now, actually. Um, I, I believe it's this week. Trisha, can you confirm that? Yeah, I actually just heard about an hour before the meeting that it will be moved tomorrow. Okay. Um, the sculpture will be stored. The plan is for the sculpture to be stored for one year and the transport and storage is being arranged by the by HYM Investments, the developers for its current location. Uh, collections manager Trisha Gorain and data coordinator Jess Kami have been building and populating the public art database and public mapping interface and they will be reporting briefly in a moment on that, which is really exciting. The Fenway Civic Association has received funds via the BPDA Fenway Park Demonstration Project application for community benefits for the purpose of securing needed maintenance and repair of Daniel Chester French's memorial to John Boyle O'Reilly in the Back Bay Fence. And we continue to have conversations with them regarding identifying additional funding sources so that we can that can take place in the near future. And I'll now pass it to Trisha Gilrain and Jess Kami. Thank you, Karen. Um, sorry, before before Trisha starts, could I just ask one question, which is um, at some point with Emancipation Group where we should be doing signage um, as a component of that site, along with uh, potentially new artwork. So any thoughts on when we could start to um, develop approaches to those? those yeah, two? we started looking for funding for the signage and um, put some proposal or we're, we're exploring that. We haven't been able to get capital funds for that quite yet, but I think we can uh, work on that again this year and try to get the necessary funding to do long-term signage on site. Great, thank you. I also had a question about the Beverly Pepper. Did we ever figure out if the Boston, city of Boston actually owns it? Um, the Beverly Pepper sculpture, we never um, determined who had complete ownership of it. Um, but we wanted to work with them under the understanding that we were all kind of invested in the piece's future placement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's a good question, Camilla, thanks. Yeah. All right, sorry to interrupt. Trisha, go ahead. Sorry, I should have left a pause. 
Um, yep, so we are very excited to announce that the collections database project has nearly come to fruition. It should be noted that the collections database project is an ongoing process and that the data and media is being added every day to flush out records to increase its impact on the mayor's office of arts and culture projects. On this slide, you will see some statistics um, and you'll also see some screenshots of the actual database that we work in daily. Um, so this is kind of how we organize everything. You'll see on the left um, a, a search um, for objects. So what you kind of get when you get a listing and then an actual object record that contains all of the information that we want to retain for each piece of public art. Um, you'll also notice some statistics on this slide. I'd like to pass it now to Jess Cami, who I've worked with for roughly a year now. Um, she's our wonderful data coordinator and she's gone through um, meticulously to make sure that all of our data is accurate and that we have populated this with um, all the art that um, is on the Boston uh, city landscape. So Jess will go into more detail about this, but we did have the intent and we have achieved that to um, have a comprehensive database that not only includes um, city of Boston art that's been commissioned and on city land, but also artwork that's on private property. Um, so I'll pass it to Jess to describe a little bit more of that process. Thanks, Tricia. As Tricia mentioned, we intend to make the internal database called TMS as comprehensive as possible. So the current thousand plus object records include publicly and privately owned artwork that are accessible to the public. The records also include artwork that has since been removed in order to preserve their records. The constituents include artists, fabricators, organizations, funders, and locations. And the 4,400 plus photos show that there's a wide range of photos per object. Simple objects such as plaques or paint boxes may only have one or two related photos, whereas more complex works have over 40. Um, we're also adding BAC records, including meeting minutes and annual reports, and linking any artworks that were discussed. And this will help keep track of the BAC's decisions and actions concerning the collection. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, on this slide, you'll see a search that we conducted within the database. Um, so this is a search that we did for long-term public art in Dorchester after 2000. So we are able to kind of pull the information and create reports for our needs. Um, so the reports can become very complex. We're working on creating diversity statistics within the database. So we'll be able to pull those statistics and those kinds of searches um, in the near future. Um, we have just presented the internal database that the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture team members will access to inform projects that will range from commissioning to conservation from the data and media covered. Um, you can understand now how helpful this system will be for record keeping, work on existing collections projects, historical record, and for planning. The public facing component is equally exciting as it invites the public to explore Boston's collection of public art. And I will pass it to Jess to talk a little bit more about the public facing component of the database, which we are calling ArtSight. Thanks, Tricia. So the data and images or select data and images that we've added to TMS are available to the public through a mapping interface that we're calling ArtSight. And ArtSight allows users to search and filter the artwork as well as save their favorites to personal collections, which they can choose to share as well. MOAC will also have the ability to curate groups of objects as digital exhibitions. So in addition to appearing um, on a map and save groups, each artwork and artist will have their own unique URL, which will facilitate sharing information about the art. Thank you, Jess. Um, I would like to just pause to see if anyone has any questions about this project. This project took about two years um, and Jess has been with us for about a year. So this is very exciting for the both of us um, to see all of this organized. Um, so definitely let us know if you have questions and follow up with us um, for access to the map, which should be available um, in the next month or so. We're finalizing um, edits on the, the public facing component right now with our code person uh, with the vendor. 
Can I ask a quick question uh, after saying congratulations for doing such wonderful work? I think this is a really a game changer for um, this organization and for the city of Boston. So bravo, you guys. My quick question is, uh, are the images downloadable in any way or is there any facet of the database that say an educator could download, since I'm looking at Fern Cunningham's work right now, could download pieces of that and mm -hmm. use for a teaching experience? Yeah, and I'll let Jess expand upon this, but a really cool functionality of the public facing interface is that you can create your own collections. Mm -hmm. So say a teacher wanted to talk about a certain artist's work, they could create their own collection of public artworks, and they could use that um, in the classroom, they could use that to build a tour. Um, it's a really exciting part of the, um, the searchable database for the public. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, users will be allowed to download the photos. Um, we're allowed to pick what resolution they're allowed to download at, but um, I'm sure we'll pick pretty high. And then in the future, there's also capacities to have other um, records linked to each object. So if um, MOAC or someone creates a PDF or a video related to the artwork that we think would be useful for the public to have, that will also be made available and downloadable. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I want to like, oh, oh. go ahead, Camila. Oh, well, I, I would like to also congratulate you. I mean, this is a massive amount of information <laughs> being made public. I mean, Jessica, Trisha, this is a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, 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 as you know, Trisha, I've been pretty involved in trying to get more information. I'm excited to have access to it. But also I have like a list that I want to, you know, dump once I do get some access to kind of see the, you know, besides the, pro, you know, the, the back end, but also the public site. And then just even one that I think of off the top of my head is being able to have functionality so that people can share it easily, not just with through for educational purposes, but also of course, through social media, they can, you know, on their Twitter, you know, Instagram, et cetera. But then in, in turn also, even to be able to dump all this public facing onto Wikipedia, yeah. you know, being able to share, that's the next step for all this information, right? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Camilo. Um, we are still talking to our coder and talking about a social media component and whether or not that will be built by the product vendor or integrated um, by us in a simpler form, such as like a Google form. But I do love the idea of an aggregate um, and then the, the component of uh, populating like a Wikipedia aggregate at the same time. Um, so there's so many options now and, and I'm sure it will evolve into the future. Yeah, I mean, in the same way that educators can create their own collection, then you know, citizens can create their own tour, if you will, right? So there's so many different ways to use this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, yeah. Jess, can you talk a little bit about the tours you started playing with that we had? The existing community ones? Yeah, so, so just for um, test runs, some of the tours that we created were um, of murals that are still visible. We did um, an emancipation walking tour that was available to us in a booklet. So someone else had created it. So we just linked all the objects. And then I also had one of paint boxes that are still on view and objects that are no longer on view as kind of a gone but not forgotten sort of tour. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, also just wanna echo how amazing this is. I also think for our future decision-making where there's art deserts and where there's um, you know lack of certain stories being told or types of artists presented, it's gonna be super useful to us as a commission and I agree, it's also super useful to the public, um, especially as we add some of these things like tours. I'm curious if there's any ability to integrate some of this or maybe slowly create links to Google Maps as well, so that if you were to you know, come across one of these, you know, the same way that a store can put information on what's inside its store, this, if, if there's some easy way, I don't know if there is, but to get some of these sites onto Google Maps so that it drives the public to our site as well when they want to learn more about the public art collection and maybe stumble across some of these tours. It might be an open way of sharing this information. I don't know if that's possible or 
too complex. I mean, it's definitely something that we can discuss with the vendor. Um, these are all really, really good ideas. And we're so grateful to have uh, commissioner feedback because we've been talking to the team and getting their feedback. So this is super, it's super great to see your, your fresh eyes on it. And there's so many possibilities. So I'd love to keep the conversation going. So do we have access to it now, Tricia? So I can definitely share um, access to the internal database if you'd like to take a look at that. Okay. Um, and then I would be happy to, when we do go live, to share um, the mapping and the searchable database on our website. Thank definitely you. And when it goes live, we should have some big press release to <laughs> tell the world about it that. It would be great. Yeah. Yeah, we, we will. And I think, um, I mean, I'm super excited. Congrats to, to the team for making this happen. And I think, you know, we've probably thought through like 10% or less of the ways to use this. Um, and so I'm really, really excited about, you know, what we decide we want to do with all of this information and how to engage people and even just like trying it out and trying different things and helping us, you know, just find more and more and more ways to um, make this available and usable and um, I just think there's going to be there's going to be so much that we can do with it. So I'm super excited, and we'll find ways to um, make a big deal about it when it's live. Um, but I think also like if there are some folks on the commission who want to um, like be more engaged in kind of next steps with this specifically, that would be great um, because this opens the door to like a whole set of public engagements, like educational opportunities, like so many things. And I think. Um, you know, now we've got to figure out how we prioritize those and um, just start creating a, a plan for, for getting it out there. But I'm, I'm pumped. <laughs> yeah, and I'd like to uh, send a throwback thank you to Chris Guerra who applied for the grant with our technology department that got us started. She saw and applied for it. So this has been in the works for a while. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. That was fantastic, exciting to see. Uh, I think next up, we move to uh, presentations for review and public testimony. So on this slide, you will see some information um, uh, uh, about how to participate. Um, here's how you can participate in today's meeting. During the meeting, please keep yourself muted. If you have technical difficulties during the meeting, you can ask questions in the chat and a member of staff will help you. After presentations and commissioners clarifying questions, I, myself and AQUA may invite public testimony. If you'd like to participate, you can raise your hand using the raise your hand icon and staff will put you in a digital line for comment. You can also let staff know that you have a question in the chat. If you're calling in, press star nine to raise your hand. Please remember to keep your comments on topic and brief. Our goal is to make this a good experience for all that community members feel comfortable sharing their feedback and questions. Be mindful of the, and respectful of other people's time when speaking so that other participants feel comfortable adding their comments. You can submit longer written testimony to BAC at boston.gov. While you may disagree with other attendees' testimony, you may not interrupt them during their allotted time. Please keep questions and comments project specific if you're called on, please state your name, and if relevant, your title, program, or organization you're involved with. Uh, next slide, I think uh, the next one, yes. Uh, the next proposal for review is the Wolf Square Street painting. Tricia will be presenting the project for the commission. Tricia? Thank you, Chair Pasnick. Um, on this slide, you will see the rendering of the street mural proposed for the roadway on Abbotsford Street adjacent to the Wolf Square Triangle in the Garrison Trotter neighborhood of Roxbury by artists Anita Morrison Matra and Napoleon Jones Henderson. Uh, this is a component of the Roxbury Safe Routes to School project at multiple intersections throughout the neighborhood and is a partnership with the uh, Partnership for Healthy Cities, Boston Transportation Department, Boston Public Health Commission, and the Garrison Trotter Neighborhood Association. BPHC leads the Safe Routes to School Task Force that includes representatives from BTD, BPS, BPD, and the Massachusetts SRTS. 
during community engagement for the SRTS traffic, calming project in the neighborhood surrounding the Ellis Elementary School was particularly crash prone. A call was opened in May looking for an artist who is resident of Roxbury or with connections to the neighborhood to imagine installations as pedestrian friendly spaces at the identified locations. On this slide, you will see the location of the proposed street mural at 33 Abbotsford Street. Uh, Roxbury on the right and also other planned locations for pedestrian friendly spaces. The installation is proposed for August 15th, 2021. The project has been reviewed by the Disabilities Commission as well as the Public Improvement Commission and they are in support of the project. The materials used will be speed resistant for safety. Artists Anita Morrison Matra and Napoleon Jones Henderson join us today as well as Jacob Wessel from BTB if uh, com the commission has any questions for them. Great, so at this time we could open up for any questions or, or would any of the artists or uh, Jacob like to say anything first? Looks like Anita's raised her hand. Would you uh, unmute yourself? You may make a statement. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you all for allowing us the space to be here and the opportunity to present this project. Um, I just wanted to let you all know that I'm a consultant working on the project and the primary um, and only artist is Napoleon Jones Henderson and we're very fortunate to have him as a part of this work. Um, there was a slight modification based on um, input from community residents. We actually had a meeting in the square out in the out in close to um, the garden itself and um, neighbors wanted to switch the location um, to be on um, Harold Street. Um, and so um, that is also the same dimensions. And so that I'm not sure if you can see my um, arrow, but it's right um, where the one way sign is. Um, so that's the slight modification um, that we want to uh, acknowledge. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Napoleon, would you like to say anything? I see. You. Uh, yeah. Well, I, my mic is open. Yes. Hello. And uh, I think. My video may now be open. Well, I guess I might as well put my head yes. up where you can see it all. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, um, well, I, I would just like to say that there's a slight adjustment that we've made to the design, which is simply to have shortened it just a small amount because it's, if you would look at the left-hand side of the image and you see the vertical line just uh, inside of the three white outlined blue, dark blue areas, that line there going from that line all the way to the right-hand side is the full composition. The uh, members of the community had uh, expressed a very strong desire to have it on Harold Street as opposed to Abbotsford Street. And uh, we're good with that. Everything is perfectly uh, in place with that. I am just very hopeful that we can get a couple of days of dry weather so that the street can actually be uh, engaged in this mural a uh, place there with the excitement and participation of the larger community. Uh, beyond that, I, unless there are any specific, well, yes, one last thing. The symbol on the far right-hand side is a, uh, a Khan symbol from the Ghanaian people of West Africa. And it is in Yame di Ribi wo Soro, which is in uh, English translation for the most part, hope and aspiration and for an intersection that engages young people on a daily basis going back and forth to the many schools in the area, surely hope and aspiration are criteria and uh, emotions we would like for those young people to always be able to experience. And it will be very present in a visual context for them as they cross that intersection. And many of them will surely be participating in the creation of this work uh, coming this uh, Friday the 13th. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't see Jacob in the room, so uh, we'll open up to commissioner comments. Any comments or questions from commissioners? I do have a question. Um, Napoleon, thanks so much for sharing information about the symbolism and imagery, which I love. I'm just wondering if there's any opportunities for any signage or interpretation at the site, or if that's been considered. Well, so, I as a as a way for visitors to kind of discover what they're looking at. Yeah, I do have a narrative of which I do wish to uh, put on the table and thanks for the invitation that we would have uh, such a 
plaque made, which can be placed right at the foot of the uh, square of the triangle uh, wolf square, where inside of the square itself is a granite stone, which the uh, uh, bronze plate has been removed, which we hope will be replaced at some point in time. But we could add the narrative that I would put together for the explanation of what the uh, design and the symbol is about uh, would be greatly appreciated. So if we can find some way for that to take place, I am on board with that 100%. Um, I just wanted to say one other thing also. Um, thank you, Anita and Napoleon. I love the design and the color scheme, but I also love that there are two people that are joined together. And I love the, um, the suggestion of teamwork, uh, especially for our students who, um, you know, it's a great way to learn, to have a, a, a learning partner or a learning team or a critique team or something like that. And I, that's the suggestion that I feel along with the hope and aspiration is work with one another. And um, I don't know if that was your intention, but that's what it's sending me right now. Um, so thank you for that. And I hope that um, young people and older people pick up on that as well. Oh, absolutely. That is precisely what it uh, is meant by that, that we are overlapping and connect, connected to each other irrespective of our individual selves, we move forward by collective motion as opposed to individual motion. And surely also you might recognize that there is no specific gender attached to either one of the figures. So they both uh, exist in the framework of both male and female within the context of two, two symbols there. And that connected relationship is always ever present. Beautiful. Anita, did you have another comment? I'm not sure if you raised your hand again or if that's originally. Yes, um, I just wanted to follow up on Brian's question. Um, you know, this is a, we're building on a culmination of um, a lot of time spent with the Boston Public Health Commission and the Transportation Department um, and Safe Routes to Schools and really thinking about the safety in this area. This continu continues to be an area of um, high-speed traffic and accidents. Um, and it's really about thinking of how we get our youth from one place to another. There are a number of schools within this designated area. Um, and the conversation has been to not only you utilize this image as a part of signage, but also to incorporate it in some of the education materials in talking about um, safe routes to schools markers. So in that area. So we hope that this image will be something that kids will be seeing in different ways and, and it will reinforce the need for safety um, and, and also beautification. So thank you. Thanks. Um, if there are no other comments from commissioners, we can see if anyone from the members of the public would like to say anything. And Tricia, are we looking for a vote on this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Someone would, Richard Heath has his hand up. Okay. Uh, oh, Richard, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, can I be heard? Yes, of course. Um, I'm very unhappy about this. Um, this ignores who Herbert Wolf was. Herbert Wolf was the first Jew in Boston killed in World War I. He lived on Crawford Street. He went to the Crawford Street Shoal, which is the Christmas Attic Center. His community was very proud of him because he was an immigrant that came to this country. His parents came from Eastern Europe and he served in the American army and he was killed. And so they were great, they were very proud of him. And the square was dedicated to him, I think in 1922, but I think the, um, the servicemen, I mean to say the veterans office at the city of Boston will have information on her, her, on her Herbert Wolf was. I think this is a bad idea. It's a bad design because it ignores who Herbert Wolf was. And if you're gonna remember things, if you're gonna remember people, remember who Herbert Wolf was. His community is gone, but everything that his community built, you look around you and you see the, um, uh, the great synagogues that are now churches. You see the Hebrew schools that are now churches. This is his community too. So I think this is a mistake. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your feedback. Um, I, 
Anita, did you want to have a response? Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, thank you for your feedback, Richard. I just wanted to um, chime in. Um, we had uh, that meeting. Um, we went to the Garrison Trotter meeting. We went to a couple of meetings, but the particular meeting that I'm talking about is when we were outside in the location um, and neighbors came out and joined us about 15, um, maybe 16 people and, you know, unsolicited. So we were talking about the mural and we were talking about the traffic calming um, and they brought up that they don't want the Wolf Square to be thought of as a small park that it's really a memorial. They, you know, they were uh, frustrated that the plaque wasn't still there. Like there's an energy um, around advocacy, around maintaining the park and, and make, making sure that that's the memorial. But I really believe that the, the art piece um, that's uh, pr proposed is a part of what's existing in the community today. And I think those two things can, um, you know, the acknowledgement and the respect for Mr. Wolf, as well as um, utilizing a piece that's bringing the community together today can be utilized um, and take up the same space without uh, any conflict, right? Um, I think that this contributes to honoring Mr. Wolf in terms of there will be more activation and possibly more focus and more eyes on making sure the place that's designated as, as his memorial is maintained and taken care of. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Maybe could we just go back to the site plan just to further understand the, the square itself? So the where is the where is the um, the place where the plaque used to be? So um, if, if I can, um, so if you if you can enlarge it a little bit, but right in the square, so where you see that big, um, it it looks like a uh, a Christmas tree kind of. It's overgrown. There's a huge um, stone, and Mr. Heath actually came. We did a neighbor. We did a um, park cleanup. So what uh, I'm marking Friday. in red is the square itself. Yes. So under this tree, yes. So in the middle under this tree is where the large stone is. And there at one point was a plaque there that honored Mr. Wolf. Um, speaking to Mr. Heath, I think the plaque had done, it went away more than 20 years ago. Um, so it's been a number of years. So the hope would be that the community advocates for that to be put back and also some of the steel fencing um, because people are utilizing it as if it's a park park and not a memorial park, right? Um, you know, um, and the debris, like I, we cleaned up a lot um, the other day. And I think that that's where the, the, the hot issue is. Um, the mural will be in front where the one-way sign is on Herald Street. And so you're saying the murals actually not occupy that spot? No, it's in the middle uh, of the roadway, yes. Yeah, the mural is actually on the roadway where the vehicular traffic moves back and forth and where people cross at the crosswalks. The issue and the interesting aspect of my engagement with the, re uh, the residents in the immediate location of the square is that they have for a long time been concerned about the absence of the plaque honoring uh, Mr. Wolf. And that was one of my first uh, inquiries by of the residents when I came on site was what happened to it because we all surely are familiar with over the course of years, many such plaques and other kinds of monuments to individuals in various squares that have been identified across the city have gone missing for various reasons. Some of them have been removed by city for protection, others have been <laughs> vandals, and some have are in place in situ and are uh, defaced. But however, this community is very much about having the plaque re restored and having the parks and otherwise uh, departments take care of the landscaping and, and, and sculpt it in such a way that it becomes uh, reminiscent of what it was in its very beginning. And hopefully the reinstallation of the plaque honoring Mr. Wolf, as well as the current use of the community by present residents and having the added mural, which would be an uh, element to create uh, a safety factor for children as well as an embellishment to the square itself and which would actually bring additional attention to Wolf Square and it'd be a collaborative that would be, I think, beneficial going forward. Great. And, and I still am having a little trouble understanding where exactly the piece will be. Could you describe it? And I could try to draw it if you tell me where to draw it. 
So, Mark, I'll also note that Jacob Wessel from the Transportation Department oh, is at the meeting. So if we had any questions for them, we could also ask him. Sure. Uh, hi, Jacob. Hey there, uh, apologies about my tardiness. So I, I believe the mural will be what's highlighted in, in light yellow there um, on the roadway itself. Is that is that the question that you're asking? Yes, I think so, yeah. So in the image on the left where it is circled, I thought that it was being moved from that or is that the current location? No, that's where it's being moved from. If you would look at the foot of the triangle going from the apex point backwards uh, from the right to the left at that one way location there, which is Harold Street, that's the location in which the mural is going to be placed. Okay. And in, this, go, in this place or? No, not this one. No, go, go a little higher up. Oh, higher right up. Okay, area. so right here. No, no, no. The oh. other direction. Right there. There you go. Right there. That's right. where I'm it's going to erase the other ones. <laughs> yeah, erase the others, and that's the real true location. And, and, and in, in regard to your question about the uh, plaque for Mr. Wolf is that in the center of that triangle, which we see here from a bird's eye view at the top of the trees, if you were to look through those trees, there's a boulder sitting in the virtually near the middle of that uh, uh, triangle where the plaque once resided. And so it's still there and it's consistent with many plaques across the city of Boston where uh, locations of putting stone boulders have been used as a foundation for uh, mounting plaques or other sort of commemorative uh, recognitions. Okay, uh, any other comments or Jacob, do you wanna say anything further? Uh, no, just happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, we're looking forward to uh, this mural being added to the intersection, which is part of this greater um, Safe Routes to School project throughout the Garrison Trotter neighborhood in Roxbury. Um, and, and I know there's maybe been a lot of talk about the, the, uh, the park itself, um, within the triangle, which, uh, is, you know, under the purview of the parks department. Um, but we hope that this will sort of bring more attention to, um, you know, w whatever folks in the community would like to see, um, uh, in the adjacent area. Um, this is, uh, just one step in, um, helping them realize whatever, uh, they'd like to see. Mm, it does seem to me that the parks or perhaps the combination of parks and us should be looking at that missing uh, plaque in the, in the uh, memorial site. So that may be something we want to discuss further. I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Mr. Heath brings that up. I personally don't see the artwork as necessarily undermining the value of the memorial. So, um, Maybe we can bring this now to uh, a motion. As, do I hear a motion from any of the commissioners? I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we accept and approve the design for the Wolf Square mural um, by artist Napoleon Jones Henderson uh, for the Roxbury community as it's presented and potentially with uh, some additional uh, educational material to, to speak more to the symbolism. Great, okay, thank you, Aqua. Um, do I hear a second to that? I'll second. All right, thank you. Uh, that was Cara, right? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so all those in favor, Aqua? Aye. Uh, Camilo? Yes. John? Yes. Michael? Yes. Cara? Yes. Uh, Brian? Yes. And Kimberly? Yes. Great, and I'm also a yes. Um, so the motion passes um, and perhaps staff can reach out to Parks at some point and talk further about uh, the, the second issue brought up by Mr. Heath. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to the design team and to the city for presenting to us. <coughs> next up, let me see here. Um, our next presentation is artist recommendations for the transformative public art program. Director Goodfellow will present for us. Karen. Thank you, Chair Patrick. Um the transformative public art called the Artist for 2021 was released in June of this year. 
For the last few years, we've been commissioning several murals and short-term projects each year as part of this program. And you can see a few examples on this slide. This year, the mayor's office launched the Joy Agenda, a citywide invitation opportunity investment in our collective well-being. And we invited artists to submit interest in proposals for the development of transformative public artworks with particular interest again in murals and short-term and new media pro art projects. The call included three distinct opportunities this year which was different than what we've done in the past. Opportunity one was an invitation for mural artists to submit their interest in qualifications for sites across the city. We asked city departments for possible sites for these murals and have been involved in a process of conversation with our, our colleagues in, in departments and doing some matchmaking. Opportunity two featured four specific sites that included partnerships with specific city agencies or community groups and for these uh, both opportunities, opportunities one and two, we are extremely happy to be working with a mural consultant this year, Liza Quinones from Street Theory, who is sharing her extensive knowledge and expertise with us on these murals and will help us with project management and facilitating uh, with, with the artists and uh, guiding conversation with community groups as, as they get started. Opportunity three was a chance for artists and organizers to submit proposals that would bring joy to our communities, whether through visual art, performances, events, or other forms of public art. And this one was special in that it wasn't just for artists to apply to, but organizers in particular. And we've worked with a variety of partners and groups to determine sites and review artists for opportunity one and opportunity two and proposals for opportunity three. Um, and then Ultimately, for Opportunity 3, we awarded 27 artists and organizers with grants ranging from $2,500 to over $30,000. $30, and we look forward to sharing more about those projects with you in September, along with a few more Opportunity 1 and 2 murals. Uh, and we are collecting short videos from all those awardees from Opportunity 3 that will be posted to our website the way we did last year. And right now, I'll present nine artists for seven sites for your review and vote. Uh, so to start us off, uh, the first project we'll be uh, looking at is part of Opportunity One and working with the Mayor's Office of Recovery Services, New Urban Mechanics, the Public Facilities Department. We identified the Engagement Center on Atkin Atkinson Street in Newmarket as a good opportunity for our mural project. Uh, and you can see renderings of the new engagement center here, courtesy of SAM Architecture. I apologize if SAM is not the correct pronunciation. It's S-A-A-M. Uh, working with Sabrina Dorsonville from Monum, we created various ways for clients and staff to weigh in on uh, artist recommendations. And as a result, we are recommending three artists for three projects at this site. We will continue to work with clients, staff, architects, artists, and city partners to determine each uh, project sites, materials, as well as the themes and the content. Uh, and we are joined by Jen Tracy and Alejandro Guzman from the Office of Recovery Services at this meeting. The first artist we recommend is Ms. Zakar. Ms. Zakar is an art collective comprised primarily of Black women. Their name is Racism Backward. They were established in 2018. Their members uh, comprise of an illustrator, photographer, designer, props, stylist, street artist, and collage artist. They started this collective to create works that celebrate women, global blackness, and play. They create narratives in the form of mixed media street art and fine art that explores histories and imagine the best case scenario future from the perspectives of women and people of color. And to my knowledge, I don't think we have any work by, by this artist. Uh, in Boston, I'm really excited for the possibilities. The second artist is Rixie Fernandez. Rixie is a Latinx interdisciplinary street artist, educator, and community activist, conceptualizing feminine divinity in their various forms. She reinterprets fantastical stories of agency and identity, like episodes of a never-ending cartoon, approaching sensuality as a range of one's mind, body, and soul. The stylized work mixes mediums like loose paints, fabric, and drawing tools to create these worldly Saboris flavors. Here, this practice is for one's reflection of our various layers and to test the limits of one, one's reality, one's depicted reality. And finally, since 1997, Alex Cook has created over 2,000 murals in 20 states and four countries, the USA, Kenya, Nigeria, and Guatemala. Alex's work focuses on community and spiritual themes expressed through nature, imagery, and storytelling. Over many years, Cook has taught art and creativity to children and adults in many different situations, ranging from alternative high schools and 
court ordered community reintegration programs to after school programs and summer camps. His work in education and the powerful experiences of creating art in public have caused Cook's artwork to become deeply social. Many of his mural projects include community participation during which community members are invited to make their contribution to a larger artwork within a structure. So those are the three artworks at the Engagement Center. And I will pause there um, in particular to see if um, Jen or Alejandro wanted to jump in. Alejandro, it looks like you're unmuted, but I, I don't hear you. I'm not hearing anything either. Alejandro, are you trying to speak? Looks like he might be having technical difficulties. Give him one more second. Okay. I think we can move forward. And Alejandro, if you get, oh, wait, he says his microphone isn't working. Um, Alejandro, if you want to send any text, I can read it out loud for you, uh, but I'll move on and I can always come back to it. So technical difficulties. The next site we'll look at is a Boston Housing Authority property that was brought to us by Youth Leads the Change, a program that gives young people uh, power over $1 million of the city's capital budget. The process is youth led by Boston teens and informed by the participatory budgeting project. The site is at 158 Stratton Street, and you can see it on the right side of the screen. We worked with members of, the, of YLC to review artists. The working group's recommendations is to commission um, artist Melissa Mandel, whose work you can see on the left. Mandel is a muralist, oil painter, and photographer. And since 2016, she's worked in Philadelphia as a muralist for the Mural Arts Program. With her artwork, she aims to instill a lasting impression of the beauty of nature, reminding the viewer of the importance of choosing to see it. Uh, the youth were particularly interested in her, her color, um, the brightness of, of her palette, and um, followed up with some questions for her as well about um, the themes that they're most interested in. Um, opportunity two was for four specific mural projects with identified themes and communities, and two of those projects, Malcolm X Park and the Rita Hester mural, will come to you later this fall as they require a longer review period. The other two projects we'll review now. The first is the new East Boston Senior Center. And I think we have Melissa um, in, in the call with us from Age Strong Boston. Um, and the renderings are courtesy of the architect, uh, Benick McCready Architecture. On the screen, you can see renderings of the exterior of the building. There are potential sites on both the exterior and the interior. We'll work with Age Strong including Commissioner Emily Shea and Melissa Carlson, who is here with us tonight. Older Bostonians who frequent the center, facilities, the architect and the artist determine the location and size of the mural. Um, um, the artist review working group was unanimous in selecting Alex uh, Garrison for commissioning for this site. Alex is an artist and arts educator. His mural work focuses on building community, working with community partners and with community input. He develops large scale exterior and interior images designed to brighten and beautify shared spaces. And Melissa, did you wanna share anything? I don't need to. I just know the seniors were very excited about this artist um, and his previous works that he's done. I know they were planning an outing to go see one of them. And they have also reported back that he's been in the East Boston neighborhood checking out the local murals that are around there as well. Thanks, Melissa. Um, and I'll, I'll add now um, that Alejandro did write and he said um, he just wanted to chime in and say how happy and grateful they are to be part of the mural projects throughout the city and are thrilled to be partners on this. Okay, next up. 
The second opportunity mural is for Mozart Park. This project is a partnership with the High Square Task Force and Ken Tingvik is with us tonight. And Boston Parks and Recreation Department is our partner on this as well, of course. The working group reviewed five artists for this commission and recommends Roberto Chow. Roberto created the existing mural, which will be removed, and he proposes installing panels along the wall for easier maintenance and installation. Roberto Chow, whose work you can see here, is a muralist, community artist, and art educator who was born in Uruguay. Chow has created more than four dozen community arts projects in the last three decades with diverse populations of his teens, persons with disabilities, urban gang members, single mothers, and elderly residents. Ken, did you want to jump in with anything? I would just say that, um, thank you, Karen. I would just say that we're very excited to work with Roberto. We have done some work with him before. And part of his unique talent, I believe, is that bringing youth into the process and making them co-creators. Um, and you know, if you see the, the murals that are still in pretty good shape at Jackson Square, both inside and outside, and you know, as I still talk to youth who participated in that project, and they say that they really, you know, felt that they were co-designers in that in that project, and we're looking forward to doing the same thing um, to re redo the it's very long 60-yard wall at uh, Mozart Park. And and again, this the theme of the mural is going to be the history of Afro-Latin music and dance, and that fits in very beautifully with our new. Um, Boston Latin Quarter Cultural District. Thank you. Thanks again. And now we have um, our next sites. Um, we've been working with the Boston Housing Authority staff uh, to both identify locations and plan community engagement with artists. And we've been looking at a number of uh, different sites and three potential sites are shown here. And these uh, sites are from left to right, Washington Manor, Patricia White, and Peabody Apartments. Um, and I think we're ranging from South End Brighton to uh, Dorchester on those. The artist recommended for the proposed site at Washington Manor in Roxbury South End is Victor Marca 27 Quinones. Marca 27 is interested in creating work that ampli amplifies and uplifts communities through the celebration of cultural heritage and identity. The artist recommended for the proposed site at the Patricia White Apartments in Brighton is Cyril Conan. Cyril Conan was born in 1973 and grew up in Queens, New York as a son of French immigrants. The graphic nature and grit of the work derives from growing up in New York City in the 70s and 80s and a love of nature and natural forms distilled in him from Celtic Breton cultures have transformed into a minimal organic and geometrical abstraction. The artist recommended for their proposed site at the Peabody Apartments is Matea Fitz. Matea Fitz is an African American and Khmer visual artist whose practice encompasses painting, drawing, photography, and design within a studio and street art discipline. Using a figurative approach with elements of abstraction, Matea depicts life in a multi layered way, inviting the viewer to interpret the works through a lens informed by personal and cultural narratives, the divine feminine and ecology. So I know that was a lot of information. We're really excited to be growing this program um, and to be doing more murals across the city and working with, um, with more artists. So please let me know uh, any questions I'll do my best to answer. Okay, thanks, Karen. This is um, very, very exciting to see so many projects all at once. Um, I did have one question on the first one. So there are actually three sites, uh, hence the three artists. Correct. Yeah. So we're looking and we're working, obviously, with um, you know, folks on, on site who are going to be running um, the, the program and the, and the building, uh, but also you know, staff of the uh, Office of Recovery Services. And we've been working with Sabrina as well to um, to think about where the best locations for each are. We were looking at someone for the exterior. Um, there is a, um, like a common room when you walk in. We did it, we did a site tour um, and there um, is sort of a, sorry, Sarah, what is the word for the area of the, the strip that goes above the common room above the windows or? The clear story? Right? It's not a clear story. It's an architectural term that they use. Oh, the um, soffit. 
the soffit. The oh, soffit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably very basic, sorry. Um, and then we were also looking, there was a, a really strong request for folks we were talking to about doing um, work in the areas that will be public, but really um, tending toward the staff who are working there, to help uplift, uplift them in their work. They were in particular, the staff were in particular very warm toward Alex's work. Great. All right, so let's see, do any commissioners have any questions for Karen about any of these pieces or the projects? Yeah, Karen, is this is this everything that we have in artist for and there are more sites or, or is this actually everything, everything? This, so we have um, um, a few more coming. So I mentioned the Rita Hester mural. We, yeah. uh, we just hired a consultant, uh, and I, uh, so Lala Shanks, who will be meeting with tomorrow to work with us on that project. So we're gonna do extended, have extended conversation about location and artists um, and what community uh, engagement should look like for the Rita Hester mural. Uh, we've also been in touch with Rita's family. Um, and then we are looking at um, the Malcolm X Park, okay. doing a, a couple murals there as well. So we're, Sarah has been working with parks um, and with community members there to set up conversations and talk about um, what that looks like. And we're thinking that will probably be multiple murals with, with different artists. Um, and then we have one more potential one as well, awesome. which we hope to Super bring to in September, but you know, we'll see how we do. Maybe I missed this, but um, the city is also involved in Billboard Hope as far as it hope. Yeah, Billboard. so that was one of the yeah. um, projects we, that got a grant through um, Transformative Public Art Opportunity 3, Your Joy. So we're in touch with Diane and um, that she's, um, you know, working on that. And I think she already sent us a video, which we'll get up okay. um, soon. But yeah, that's one of the great projects. And she said that it's extended another year now. Yeah, the, the grant supports a, another full year, I think, of her um, doing that project. Okay. So we can send out information. I think we have, we have a press release out about that already, uh, but we can I share that. So. It just seemed like a lot of information to, to put into the presentation. Uh, if any of them do need uh, re review and vote, we'll, we will be sure to bring them in, but we can do a better update on those in September as well. Great, looking for other comments or questions. Uh, well, I'd like to say just how exciting it is. There are so many uh, vibrant, fresh ideas here that, and, and corners of our neighborhoods that, <laughs> that need some help, uh, as well as some beautiful interior spaces and buildings that I think will be um, even made uh, richer by the presence of all of this imaginative artwork. So I'm, I'm very excited by the collection that you've presented to us and thankful for all the work that uh, you and the rest of the team have done to um, curate this collection of um, really wonderful stuff for us. Thank you. Other comments? I can also open it up to the public. Is there anyone from the public who would like to make a comment? Seeing none. Um, I would just add one, one thing in case um, anybody is thinking, why don't we do this every year? And where is this money coming from? Um, uh, we've done something like transformative or transformative itself, we've called it that multiple years now, um, with funding from the city's public art fund. And we've been able to augment it um, in some different ways. But this year it's it's like, you know, times 10. Um, and that we're able to do so many projects and big projects because of the, um, mayor's investment in the joy agenda and increase to the office budget for FY22. Um, in addition to ARPA um, federal recovery funds um, that we're using to help hire artists who have been out of work. So um, I just say that to say that the, that we're able to do a lot more this year, but it's also that's, you know, we don't know if that is going to continue at that level going forward. So I think like as we've been building out this program, it's so amazing to see. Um, I would just flag for, for the commissioners, you know, we'll have to start thinking about <laughs> what does it look like to keep this going um, at this level, which is, I think, altogether going to be close to half a million dollars. I'm thinking across like several spreadsheets in my head. Um, up from, you know, 70,000 or something 
um, two years ago. So just, just something to keep in mind. It's, it's super exciting and we have to do a really good job of, of talking about it and showing the work so that we can kind of keep this level of investment up. Great. I love that we have a joy agenda. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's pretty great. And that it's getting a half million dollars in the a line item. That's uh, fantastic. So um, Karen, do we need a uh, overall vote? Is that what you're thinking would be best? Yes, we would. We would uh, okay. appreciate that. All right. So I would look for a motion from somebody to um, uh, approve the recommendations from the various groups, perhaps. Is that what we would want to say? I'll make a motion. Great. To approve. OK. <laughs> motion to approve. The collection of artworks, maybe we should say, or the collection of art, art artists recommended to us. OK. I'll make a motion to approve the collection of artists recommended to us. Great. Uh, so would somebody like to second that? I will second that. Okay. okay. So we have Kim uh, making the motion, Brian seconding it, and I will go through the list here. So actually, I lost my list here. So I'm going to do this from memory. Aqua Holmes. Yes. Uh, Brian Hone. Yes. Uh, Kim Pinder. Yes. Kara. Yes. Michael. Yes. Uh, John? Yes. And wait, who did I miss? Camilo. Oh, Camilo stepped out for a moment, so he's not able to vote right now. Uh, and I would be a yes as well. So did, if I got everybody, the motion passes. Uh, so congratulations, Karen. This is great. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a very transformative for sure in many places. So thank you for all your hard work on this. Uh, our next project for review is the final acceptance of uh, Matthew Hintzman's Why Then Web. Sarah Rodrigo will present, Sarah. Thank you, Chair Pasnick. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Why Then Web? was commissioned in 2017 as the first project that was fully funded by the Percent for Art program. The commission last saw this project in March of 2020 when you approved the final design. And you can see an image from that presentation above, um, along with a photograph of the artist, Matthew Hinsman. Uh, this project is at the campus. Well, I'll read the statement that Matthew shared with us. Um, as our first accessioning project, we've asked him for some, some text uh, about the sculpture. So we'll let the artist speak through me. Um, the installation did take several months and Tricia, if you could move to the next slide. And the chairs were finally installed on August 1st. The loam was just placed today. The lawn at the municipal campus that includes the Jamaica Plain Branch of the Boston Public Library and the BCYF Curtis Hall Community Center has been altered with a sculptural intervention. A series of low brick walls now zigzag across the lawn on an approximate north-south axis. Some of the walls are capped with brightly colored glazed bricks, while others are more conventionally capped with slabs of granite. Separate from the walls, five chairs inhabit the lawn. The chairs take their form from ubiquitous aluminum tube, vinyl webbed folding chairs found in millions of backyards and lawns. Yet these chairs are constructed of bronze, sculptures of chairs, immortalizing this very familiar, close to home piece of furniture. Passersby are welcomed into the site via the newly created gate off the South Street sidewalk, where a section of the 150 foot iron fence and granite curb has been removed. And for some context, I did not know this when Matthew titled the piece, a width is a, or wide, I don't know how to pronounce it still, is a continuous vertical section of masonry, one unit in thickness. It may be independent of or interlocked with an adjoining wide. And a web is something formed by or as if by weaving or interweaving, an intricate set or pattern of circumstances, facts, etc. In the office. 
Um, next slide, Tricia, if you would. Matthew also provided us with some interpretive text of the artwork. This sculptural intervention provides audiences with a myriad of ways to engage with the work and resist a didactic or and or singular interpretation. A refined level of craft and material use coupled with the ubiquity of the forms afford viewers multiple vantage points with which to enter into dialogue with the work and to construct meaning and or narratives. Themes of history, community and monuments may inform a viewer's interpretation. And Trisha, if you'll move to the last side. As the first commissioning project to potentially be added to the collection, since Trisha and Jess implemented the collections database, the public art team is still working to determine which of all of our thousands of files about this project will be included in the permanent records. Um, we will be sharing images of the artwork once the grass grows in completely, which will be sometime in late September or early October, but didn't feel that it was appropriate to hold up the accessioning of this work into the collection while we wait for grass. Um, Karen, I don't know if there's anything that you would like to add. No, just congratulations, Sarah. Thank you for all your work on this. And that's it, I think. Okay, great. I, I do have a small question, which is how will the grass relate to, if you go back one mm -hmm. slide, how will the, will the grass cover those? They look like they're the foundations to the chairs. It will, and I'm, I apologize. I thought we had the loam photos in here and I put in the wrong photographs, it appears. The loam goes up to the base of the, the chairs themselves. So they appear to oh. sit directly on the lawn. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, I really think they're wonderful pieces. It's, <laughs> it's so fantastic to have something that's so commonplace be dealt with in such a noble material um it's a kind of unusual exercise but really uh i look forward to sitting in them you know i add that there is the sample chair is now in the front of the library so if you go into this branch um in that point that you can see in the background of this slide there's a sample chair and you can sit in them while we wait for the grass to grow it's still fenced off um, but you can go and sit and it's a very strange experience uh, i expected it to give under me as mm -hmm. web chairs do, and it does not, but it's still quite comfortable. Great. Well, thank you for all your work shepherding this through, and uh, thank you to the artist for the vision. Um, I, th so I think I just understood the title for the first time when she just said that too, the web. Yeah. <laughs> it's the brick and the, yeah. Yeah. And the uh, surface. Uh, so are there comments or questions from commissioners now? I would just say this is a pretty celebratory moment that we're getting to because I think, um, I mean, Karen, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first project that we've worked on kind of like under the percent for art framework, um, even though it was funded through another department. Um, so really exciting to see it come together. And I hope, I hope we can all be there in person um, and sit in these chairs Absolutely. <laughs> and, and enjoy it. <laughs> It's a huge, I'll also say we're, you know, with Napoleon being here, his was one of the first Napo capital funded projects we ever did, uh, long-term installations, um, the Roxbury, Roxbury Rhapsody in the bowling building. So um, yeah, that was sort of the first pilot we did of doing this work. So it's very exciting um, to, to have you here, Napoleon, for this moment, as well as we sort of make this more of a long-term uh, commitment from the city. Perhaps we can have a uh, public meeting sometime at the BPL branch out there and all sit in the chairs once, once we're back into physical meetings. Yeah, okay. there's benches too. I will say that, you know, you're not getting a great view of it from here, but the, you can sit all along the, there's space for all of us. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> nice group shot. Yes. That would be awesome. I mean, Karen, I wonder if you could just say a word about this last step in our process too, and more generally, because there's some new sure. commissioners, it might be helpful to just say, what, what are we doing today? Sure, and I'll have a Trisha and Jess on call too to, um, to add. Uh, but, you know, we, as we've been developing our policies and um, processes, we've been really trying to make sense of how we track all our art. And so we have these approvals that we give, uh, but this last vote is really important in that we're saying, 
you know, we, we approved the design for this, the preliminary, we approved the artist, we approved the preliminary design, the final design, but this is us saying, okay, this is the artwork we thought we were going to get and we're taking it on and we're taking ownership as the city and, and as the public. Um, Jess or Trisha, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that's um, pretty accurate, um, a description. Yeah, in terms of, you know, generally about uh, collections of artworks, um, you know, to define what's within your purview and to collect all of the information that is helpful in terms of moving forward with any projects. Um, during the lifespan of the project, it's important to just keep an accessioned record and to accept it into the collection legally. So hopefully we won't be in a place where we'll be like, do we know this is ours? Like, whose is this? <laughs> Um, as, as we've been seeing, or who put this here? We never approved it, is it ours? Um, so we're really just trying to plan for future us to make their lives easier too. Great, here's to future us and easy lives eventually. Um, other, other questions or comments from the commissioners before I open it to the public? Hearing none, are there any comments from members of the public? I hope the public will enjoy engaging with this piece very soon. So it's about a month away or a month and a half away for when the fences will come down. Great, hearing none from that, then let's move to a motion. And I think the motion should be to uh, accept this piece into our collection. Mark, as chair, should you do it? Uh, no, I think the honor could be someone else's. Why not you, John? I move to accept. Oh, actually, wait, hold on. Does somebody live in JP? Exactly. Anybody from JP? I can't remember. Oh, I guess Karen. What about Kim? Are you on the, on the line there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> You're JP-ish? Oh, yeah, I'm on the board of Roxbury JP. Yeah. Great. Would you like to make the motion to accept this into our collection? Sure, I'll make another motion. I Great. make a motion <laughs> to accept this um, work of art into our collection. Great. Great. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Okay, so that was second from John. And I'll read down the list. Um, say yes, if you are in favor of the motion. Aqua Holmes? Yes, I'm in favor. Camilo? He may still be out. Um, John? Yes. Michael? Enthusiastically in favor. Great. Uh, Cara? Yes. Brian? Yes. And Kim? Yes, absolutely. Great, and I'm a yes as well. So the motion passes unanimously. Uh, we have a new piece in our collection. Congratulations, everyone involved. Um, and I will say having a joy agenda and then getting new artworks today for the city of Boston has, has been a really good afternoon to uh, spend together. I do think that's the end of our business for today, correct, Karen? It is, I think um, there was a refresh to the presentation so you could see the new photos that um, we didn't have in there. Um, Sarah's very determined to make sure you see this, this artwork. Um, you, so you wanna share that with I, us again? Yeah, if, I think it'll be coming up hopefully. Um, I think if- Trisha, could you share again? And just go back one slide. And it should show you six images. Oh, did Do it I not? need to refresh? The yeah, you need to refresh. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. Right I just feel like you really need no, to see it. <laughs> it's worth it. I think this piece is going to invite a lot of communing and spontaneous parties. It's kind of set up for it. <laughs> it really is. Just enough seating, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and it, it's funny thinking back on the first community meetings in um, Curtis Hall, and you know, folks really were concerned we we're going to stick, you know, some huge sculpture there that would stop them from being able to hang out. So it's really nice to see what a great job Matthew did. I did try to get a, a chair for myself. I just have to let you know that he <laughs> was like. No way, unless I wanted to pay up front. So just know mm -hmm. that if you were thinking about it. I'd, I'd love one of those chairs in my Maybe we could get a group discount, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with Sarah being at City Hall, we're a little bit off our game because she's normally our screen share. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, tech's a little, a little tricky today. So apologies for putting you on the spot there, Trisha. Yeah, thank you. I think it should be slide 46 now. Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, they are. Huh. Oh, great. Yeah, without the base, they look great. Awesome. That looks fantastic. Beautiful. Great. All right. So our last step then is to uh, make a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion so Kim doesn't have to again. <laughs> uh, I'll make a motion that we adjourn. Would anybody like to second that? I second that. Thank you, Aqua. Uh, so all those in favor say yes, Aqua. Yes. John. Yes. Michael. Yes. Kara. Yes. Brian. Yes. Kim. Yes. And Camillo, I don't think he's back either. So, uh, but the, and I'm a yes as well. So the motion passes unanimously again. Um, thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great uh, end of August as we, we look forward to uh, our next fall meeting in September. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great Good seeing night. you guys. Peace. Awesome.